Hey everyone, I'm your host, Robbie Spruzinski, and thanks so much for joining us on episode number 53 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Today's guest is one of the newest additions to Cards Chat team of ambassadors. She's a former dancer who has worked her way from knowing zero about the game of poker to amassing almost $300,000 in live tournament earnings, plus a bunch more online, including a recent score for $85,000. And that's after transitioning from primarily being a successful cash game player. She's built a tremendous resume of her own, but she's also a fiance of our recent guest, Jesse Sylvia. Ashley Sleeth, welcome to the Cards Chat podcast. Thanks, Robbie. That was great. <laughs> there you go. Checks in the mail. That's what I always say, right? You, guys, <laughs> you send me the intros, I'll read whatever you send me. It's all good. <laughs> You're a pro. It's well, it's well earned. And it's good to see. I haven't seen you like sort of in person like this in a good four years. It's, yes. uh, it's cool to see you again. How have you been? How's life been for you? Life has been great, actually. Um, a lot of time at home, like everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we just moved into this new house in January in, mm -hmm. uh, in Vegas still. But we moved my grandma out here from Florida. So she's living with us. Wow, and that's so we nice. We absolutely love it. It's great. That's, that's cool. You know, more family is better. That's, uh, yes, that's, that's yes. a great Yes, especially thing. in a place like Vegas. You kind of forget. You're like, oh, do kids exist? Do like older right. people <laughs> exist? Like we're all kind of like the same age, kind of like bachelors kind of, you know, yeah. living the Vegas lifestyle. For sure. That's, that's really <laughs> cool. Uh, well, you know, in the intro, I mentioned that you started out literally knowing nothing about the game. And, you know, when I read that, I was like, you know, that really reminds me a lot of Maria Konnikova. Uh, you know, she was our guest yeah. in episode six here in the podcast. She didn't even know how many cards there were in the deck. So like, yeah. was it oh, that, wow. was it that to that extent for you as well? You didn't even know that or you played Go Fish and, and you know, that kind of stuff. For a yeah, I knew how many cards there were in a deck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I got the check, you know, check mark on that one. Okay. Um, but I did not know what poker was at all. Uh -huh. um, the first time that I even kind of asked Jesse about it, uh, I asked him, you know, the typical question that we get a lot as poker players is, do you count cards? Is that right. what you do for a living? So that's what I thought he did. And I just kind of thought it was like this taboo thing that I shouldn't ask him about. I should just oh. wait for him to tell me mm -hmm. stuff. And, um, but he's like, no, no, it's a lot more skill than that. And then, um, it wasn't until we moved together to Vegas where I really was like, okay, you need to teach me this game if we're going to, you know, stay dating because right, <laughs> this right. is a whole other language. Like Jesse on the vineyard or like on the island where he's grew up and where he's from, everyone's mm -hmm. kind of low key. It's hippied out. It's uh, you're going surfing, right. and, you know, it's all very chill. Poker is not spoken about at all. So then to meet this new Jesse in Vegas, I was like, <laughs> Oh, okay. So yeah, that's where, that's where I started. Oh, very interesting. So like when, so when you first heard about the game, you just, I guess you treated it as like, that's another thing, or I'm just sort of like, what, when did you sort of get into it yourself? You know, of like, mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. I want to also play beyond, okay, this is just what Jesse does. Well, I was terrified to play at all live. So I, mm -hmm. I just want, I, like I said, I just wanted him to teach me the game so I could know what they're talking about. Okay. I really, resented just sitting in the corner listening to them talk hand history so I was like hey, can you just teach me this language that's all you know that's all I want to know he's like are you sure and all his friends were like don't teach her how to play poker you know <laughs> it's like what we do now it's like oh don't start now you know it's a it's a long road but um no I really wanted to know what they were talking about that's it and um wow. I remember him <laughs> laughing about me asking like what does barrel mean or what is you know like shove or jam and he was like they all mean this and I'm like well right. then why don't you just say that why don't you just say bet why do you say barrel why do you just say see bet you know right so it was fun to learn um right. but actually starting to play he was like look let's just let's just put you on I think it was like black chip poker or carbon one of the carbon okay skins. And um, he was like, let's just set you up a little account. We'll play some sit and go so you can get it better because we were just hand dealing in our little apartment. Oh you know, we God. lived in Panorama. Right. So it was like me, Jesse and Mike Del Vecchio just dealing to each other. And of course, 
Delvecchio was over there just rolling his eyes. Like, I can't believe we're doing this right now. And um, I remember I like scooted my cards forward a little bit and Mike just took them because he thought th- that meant folding in his right. mind. That's just like muscle memory. And I was like, wait, 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 I had a straight. <laughs> he would right. just take my cards. Huh. And um, so they kind of taught me a little bit about um, how move, like movements of your cards, movements of your right. chips, what that means at a table. Hmm. And um, I didn't play live until there was this like $200 MGM ladies event. And I was like, okay, if I ask stupid questions, like I won't feel as embarrassed to ask like these ladies, surely they'll be more helpful or I just wouldn't feel as intimidated. So, Mm -hmm. so I did that. I remember I was super nervous. I didn't eat anything all day. I had like a frappuccino and I just sat there at the table and I was just so nervous. Wow. And Jesse railed the whole thing at a little $200 ladies event. Good. So that was my first experience. And then I just really got into it. I was like, wow, you can, you can do really well. There's a lot of flexibility. You can yeah. travel. And all the reasons why I'm still playing today is why I got into it then. Right. So. And of course, of course, in the card check community, we all know why we love this game and it's cool to yes. hear sort of that, that origin story. I know we, I laugh and I'm sure everyone else was laughing and, and you're laughing as well. Cause it's just yeah. funny to look back at that whole beginner's yeah. stage yeah. I'm just wondering, like, do you feel that there's a little bit high of a barrier to entry? You know, I mean, like you obviously had, mm-hmm. you know, the, the the golden opportunity here. You know, you introduce to someone who's a professional, who has the patience, yeah. who wants to teach you this sort of thing. Is that something that anyone, let's say, who comes upon this podcast and starts hearing it, it's like, oh, well, she just lucked out that she, you know, was with Jesse. I could never learn this game so easily and I'd be too embarrassed. Like what, what, what's your thoughts on that though? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Mm. Um, the, the niche sort of that um, Andrew Nimi, Brad Owen and all of those vloggers fill is for this reason mm. alone. I think if I was new to poker and I just stumbled upon this and I was like, ooh, this game is pretty cool. And I put, stuck it in YouTube and I saw all these guys they show you how to buy in at the table. You watch their chips get onto the table. You see how the movements of the cards, if all that is brand new to you, it seems overwhelming. Mm-hmm. But if you watch these guys' vlogs enough and you see this repetitive thing happening um, at the table, you feel like you're there and you feel like you've already done this and it's not so nerve wracking. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I personally lucked out, but I think today there's a lot of resources and a lot of people that you can follow um, their journey and just kind of copycat that until you feel comfortable yourself. Awesome, that's a fantastic answer. It's something I never even considered, you know, because when I'm watching them, I'm you know watching for the entertainment. I'm very far away from Las Vegas, so it makes me feel yeah. that I'm there. You know, yeah. the the one the one sort of, but you're absolutely right as far as like a you know a beginner. Um, the, the one thing I would just put if it put a, a little bit of an asterisk to those beginners out there, you don't always have to call pocket jacks jiggities, and you don't always have to lose all three runouts of the 510 massive pot. So just going to put that out there. <laughs> right, um, right. Yeah, we haven't yet gotten bread on. We'll get him, but uh, thanks for yeah. referencing. Uh, and episode. also, yeah, go ahead. Also, not every every half hour is not a bomb pot. In most Correct. Cases. Right, right. So you know. PLO, right. Uh, and then you referenced the episode number 52, Andrew Nimi, right before yours, uh, the episode that just came out. Uh, and we will be having some more vloggers on the lineup uh, in future Great. episodes. Um, introduced you as someone who used to be a dancer. That's interesting. Are we talking like ballet dancing? or you know something like choreographed for music videos kind of dancing like how did that sort of come about you went to Juilliard maybe to learn dancing (laughs) I did not go to Juilliard okay Um, that would have been really uh ballet heavy but I I I grew up dancing since I was five but yes all of the above what you said I've done you know jazz ballet modern tap um and when I I went to college I majored in dance that was what um I went to study and it was it was a school in Allentown, Pennsylvania, oh, wow. random spot, yeah. but they had a very good theater and dance program. So that's the reason I, I went there. And yes, um, I was mostly into choreo- to choreography myself um, and mostly modern dance. Huh. Um, I was in a company for a year or two after college that was more like Afro-contemporary. Okay. And um, yeah, it was just really cool. A lot of 
like social and political commentary within the pieces. And it was, it was a wonderful time. I mean, I grew a lot as a person and it was great. Um, but living in Vegas, I felt, I mean, I kind of put my own walls up, but I felt very much like if I was going to be a dancer in Vegas, it had to be, um, no, not stripper. <laughs> it had to be uh, going on Cirque du Soleil. Well, when you say you're a dancer in Vegas, everybody thinks, oh, stripper. Like, no, no, not a stripper. Um, I thought that meant I had to try out for Cirque du Soleil, which is uh -huh. not something I wanted to do. Right. I didn't want to do the same show twice a night, every night, for sure. however long your contract existed. So I don't know. I kind of just stumbled into poker and have kind of stuck with it. I still take classes. I still take dance classes. Um, I taught yoga for a while and oh, I still take cool. yoga every day. Cool. So I'm still very uh, physical and I mm -hmm. do like that outlet, mm -hmm. but yeah, I've kind of sort of morphed away from it. That's interesting. <laughs> now in poker. Yeah. You know, with, with folks who have a little bit of a different background or, you know, tremendous experience in another area, I always wonder if there's any sort of crossover of, you know, the fat, the experience that you have and sort of the, um, uh, oh, there's like a word for it, like, the, the mental mindset that you had to, to hone there as a dancer. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. Does any of that transfer over as far as like poker skills, stamina, something like that when you're playing a tournament? Um, certainly every, everything off the table mm -hmm. um, contributes to how you play at the table. And I think having a dance background or just being interested in like fitness and nutrition in general helps you helps your game, um, especially if you're playing a lot of tournaments and you need right. some endurance and you need um, to focus and not have a lot of mood swings during the day, just to, just to be very steady. That really helps. But also as a dad, like if you're thinking about having a career in dance, you're, you're already going into your adult life with this idea that you're going to have like just something different from a nine to five. Right. So <laughs> I knew I wanted to travel. I knew I wanted to be like gig oriented almost. So mm -hmm. Poker kind of fits that as For well. Sure. Well, that's cool. That's, that's a nice uh, crossover. Uh, well, you know, anyone who's played with you and uh, who's been listening so far just for the first few minutes, you know, obviously you come away with this feeling, hey, you're fun, you're friendly, I enjoy playing with you at the <laughs> table. Um, I grabbed a quote from you from the recent uh, AMA that you had on the Cards Chat forums and the thread there, uh, and we will have a couple questions about you for that in a bit, but you had this quote. Um, no sitting at miserable or nitty tables for me. So how, how important is it for you to bring that positive energy to a game? Uh, it's so important. And I feel like, honestly, I took a, a kind of a hard left turn away from cash games for a while to join tournaments because of not saying everybody has to be fun all the time. I certainly have days where I put my headphones in, head down, I'm ready to just focus on playing poker, right? And I don't necessarily feel like engaging everyone at the table. Right. Not saying you have to be on all the time, but I do think it's like, if somebody is like trying, if somebody's trying to talk to me, I'm not going to just leave them hanging. I'm going to try to engage. I mean, that's what makes people want to keep coming back to the tables. That's, I mean, you're just a human, right? Like you want to have a nice interaction and a nice day. Sure. Um, so I, I think uh, sometimes people can take it a little too far and be very focused, but yeah, I think it's very important um, to have a good time every day, right? What are we doing playing poker every day? If we're not trying to have a good time, like we right. might as well be doing that nine to five, that thing that people criticize as uh, poker players. Um, but tournaments, the reason I kind of focus on that is because even if everybody is very competitive and very focused tournaments, they're so dynamic. The stack size are changing all the time. Levels are always going up. People are, you, the, the 12 noon person has changed dramatically by 11 PM, you know, wow. so that person is in a different, per, in a different state, everything is kind of always evolving in tournaments. So even if they are kind of not super friendly, I have something else that's keeping me engaged at the table and keeping me having a good time. That, that's really interesting. You know, like I, I want to hone in on like that, that tournament versus cash. I mean, like I, I've never been a pro at either, but obviously, you know, a bunch of us, you know, in the card stack community, we played both tournaments and cash games. Uh, could you sort of ballpark it? You know, what would you say the, the ratio is of fun to not fun uh, <laughs> that you have at a tournament table versus at a cash table? Hmm. I think- I was saying, I wouldn't say not fun, but more like seriousness rather. I, 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 
call it that. So I don't know if it's necessarily cash first tournaments as okay. it is environment. Um, hmm. I think the environment that like running up Reno is a really good example. I freaking love that event and I cannot wait for them to bring it back. If they bring it back, I'm not sure. Um, that you can play cash games, you can play tournaments. Everybody is there. They right. kind of go in with the attitude. Like we're all here to have fun. Mm -hmm. And just, just that simple thing of everybody going into it with that mindset changes the whole event. The, you know, it's 10 days of people just like out of control at the table, just having a good time. Um, and that, I think that is kind of just like a spirit, maybe like one or two people at your table, if they bring it to your table, it livens up the whole game. We've all had that experience where the table's kind of quiet and, yep. and one guy comes along and just livens it up. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's really just, it's not so much the game. It really is just a, it's a people game. We're yep. all, we're all sitting there playing it. So if we feel like, Hey, it's kind of miserable. Let's kind of change it. Mm -hmm. Um, then you, you most likely can. I guess right. what I was talking about with miserable or nitty is the people who are like, they're, they're tuned out. They're not trying to reciprocate any energy. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. that, that's the, the, the type where you leave. So I feel like if to, in a long winded way of answering your question, maybe tournaments, there's, you're more likely to not get that uh, energy brought back to you okay. <laughs> in a cash game you know, maybe it depends. I mean, if they're, right. if they're regulars or if they're just in Vegas for a weekend, right. um, it really I, just depends. I would, I would go even one step further and I'd say, well, if no one is that person at the table, then go ahead and be that person. Go ahead exactly. and, and think, say, Hey, yeah. everyone want a beer? Beer's on me, even though it's really on yeah. the casino or yeah. something like that. <laughs> yeah. Why not? That's a major light bulb that kind of went off maybe for me for like the past just sitting in quarantine mm -hmm. where I came back and I was so pumped to be back finally playing live poker that I, I kind of just like charged to the table. I was having a good time. And then I was like, Oh my gosh, like, why didn't I just do this all the time? Why did I just kind of like let, you know, myself be kind of shy and kind of hide. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it really is just up to you how fun you're going to have, how, how much fun you're going to have that day so right and obviously this whole year and a half has taught us a lot about ourselves when we've had time to ponder and reflect and you know why wait for someone else to, to be the, yeah. the, the action let's go ahead and spread those smiles uh, it's, yeah. it's actually um it's very consistent with what you said on your on your intro page on cards chat it says the biggest thing i've learned since turning pro in 2017 is the value of having fun at the table so you know true yeah. true to word so you yeah. certainly said it um, one of the questions we always ask our interviewees uh, here at the Cards Chat podcast, who is the friendliest player you've ever competed against at the tables? <laughs> is it cheating if I say Jesse? Because yes. it's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so who is the second friendliest player? We'll give you that one. Uh, hmm. Man, that's, that's... Actually, now I'm thinking I have run it up on the brain. Kevin uh -huh. Martin. Oh, Kevin, Kevin Martin, Martin is nice. He's great. He's really, what you see if you watch his Twitch streams is what you get in person. He's just there to have a good time. Very friendly. And every, yeah, everything you would want at the table. Yeah, excellent. Besides how good he is. Right. <laughs> excellent. Actually, he just recently won, uh, I forget what it is that he won. He just won something also. Uh, and of course, we got to you know, give a shout out to former guest. He was episode number 14. That's uh, always, uh, you know, we always do that. Anytime someone name drops a guest, there's so many episodes. This is episode You've number You've hit a lot of good three. ones so far. Yeah, we try. We try. Um, <laughs> you know, we had, it's episode 53, a year's worth of episodes already. Uh, go oh. back and listen to them after you hear this show, guys. Uh, if you haven't already, of course. Um, well, Ashley, you know, the, this is a question sometimes people, you know, positive people such as yourself, such as myself, you know, we're still human beings at the yes. end of the day. We can get bummed out, you know, maybe not tilted, but kind of a little soured by a bad beat or, or something like that. Or by oh, the yeah. Day. What tips do you have to get yourself out of that kind of a funk when Maybe you're just, you know, not at A plus, you know, peppy perky kind of level. Or if you're in some sort of a downswing or a frustrated, what kind of tips could you offer? Because it really does happen to everybody. Uh, this could be applied to many things, but for poker specifically, um, I think in general, if you are having trouble feeling gratitude for what you have, 
Um, and you ask yourself the question, um, how would I feel if this was taken away from me or my life? Mm. It helps you find that gratitude real quick. Yeah. <laughs> you just, you just, you just zoom right back in. Like, all right, if I could never play poker tournaments and I had to work a different job, you're like, oh, all right, I'm good. <laughs> it kind of pulls you out. Like, yeah, poker sucks right now, but it would suck way more to not have it in your life. Oh so yeah. That's kind of a good tip. That's an excellent answer and certainly uh, so one that resonates with me. I, you know, I went self-employed uh, in 2017 and every time, whenever it is I'm waking up, which is usually eight something or nine something, like, man, I just, you know, I don't feel like whatever, but at least I don't have to commute today. You know, yes. <laughs> like you just focus yes. on those blessings. Like and after said. a couple of weeks being in LA, that is a huge thing. Yes. <laughs> not want to commute. <laughs> Certainly, certainly. Um, well, it's not, it does seem like beyond the, the reasons that you mentioned, uh, that move that you made from cash games to tournaments turned out to be pretty GTO for you. You've been crushing <laughs> it. Uh, you recently won a uh, Ellipse event, $500 event at the Venetian for $14,000 plus. Um, was it more special? I mean, you alluded before that the first time you entered was a $200 ladies event. Was it more special to win a ladies tournament? Hmm. I wouldn't say more special. It okay. was definitely really fun. It hmm. was in, it was at when um, Venetian was still running their long series and it was a lot of it was taking place at Palazzo. And so okay. there was a lot of people, we were surrounded by slot machines, which people complained about, but it did form rails that, you know, were just random people passing by, which doesn't That's really cool. happen in a lot of poker rooms. And I, I think that having nine ladies at a table <laughs> attracted more because they were all just kind of hanging on the rail like, what is going on? These like nine women gambling, at, you know, and there was trophies sitting there. So it was more fun. I wouldn't say it was more special. Okay. But yeah, it was definitely fun. Interesting. Well, can you point to something specific? I'm just curious, you know, like we've had quite a few women on the podcast. I didn't count exactly, but you know, a good 20% of our guests uh, have women, which, you know, it's still not 50, 50, but that's a lot more representative uh, yeah, we only make sometimes. up 3%. Yeah, <laughs> so. which, which is crazy. So we try to, you know, have as, as many women as we can specifically for that reason. Is there something that you can point to? I'm sure a lot of our, our listeners and people watching are female. What is something that's a little bit extra special and a little extra fun uh, at a ladies event for you? I think it reminds you of kind of where you started. A lot of people, when they play ladies events, it, it is similar to me. They're either playing for the first time or they play at home with, you know, it's, it's a uh, co-ed or whatever, at home. Sure. but they came out to play a bigger tournament because of the social aspect. Like they know these ladies and they've seen them around the country and they came out to Vegas specifically to play this event. And it's probably on the higher buy-in for them. Um, so I think that's, what's great about it for me. I, I get excited seeing people, kind of enjoy themselves when they maybe in level one were looking pretty nervous mm -hmm. <laughs> and by like after the dinner break the whole table's doing like tequila shots and everything's <laughs> opened up and you know that that's a that's a great moment for me because I'm just like yeah good for you for trying for trying to do something that maybe you weren't a hundred percent comfortable with and now you're definitely comfortable right. with right so. awesome that, that definitely um you know it, it captures that vibe and I know I've I've been on the sidelines, obviously, I've witnessed ladies' events, and it certainly has a, a special fun vibe. Uh, you got to give the shout out there to Lupe Soto, who was our guest yeah. in episode 50. She was the founder of the LIPS organization, huge promoter, lifelong for decades of ladies' events. Uh, Linda Johnson, uh, episode 39, same thing, always promoting women in the game. Um, you know, you're one of the newer faces in the game, you know, just a few years ago, getting into it as a woman, is there something that perhaps you could speak to, to other women who are also like perhaps taking interest in this for the first time, maybe some advice or, or something that like, don't be afraid. I'm not, I'm, I don't wanna lead in too much with the question, but do you have any sort of thoughts for someone who may be in that situation? I think showing up to the table and letting all of those sort of distracting thoughts of what do they think of me as a woman playing poker mm. is very helpful. I think I let that uh, level me in hands for a long time when I first, first started playing way, way back when, but when I first started to play tournaments, especially if I was playing against people, Oh, I respect their game or they're a big pro or like, what do they think? Uh, I would over adjust how I played thinking that they were trying to like exploit the fact that I'm, 
female and maybe like mm. put all these perceptions of what they thought of me on them when they have never proved that yet. They hadn't played a hand versus me that would lead me to think that. Right. So, so I would say to ladies, show up to the table, uh, just it, as much as you can try to let those thoughts kind of drift away and really just focus on the action itself. And if the play has proven that they think of you a certain way or they think of you as a certain player, then you can react to that. That's just playing good poker. Right. Um, but I think a lot of people kind of go into it like, oh my gosh, because I'm a woman, it's going to change all of these things. Just let that go because most of the time it really doesn't. And um, I love that advice. I, I've never actually heard that before. Um, and I love it because, you know, we talk about trailblazers of the game you know it used to be that you know folks such as yourself you know and, and to an extent still do you look at the lupes the lindas you say okay i don't need to be afraid to approach the table in the first place and now you get you know newer players such as yourself we had maria ho Kristen bicknell that 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 sort of population to hear that you know that's what's so beautiful is these ladies can learn from your experience and they're that much farther down the learning yes. curve and they don't have to, hopefully when they hear that sort of a thing, it's not just, you know, a, a marketing line. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it, it, you know, if you're just marketing the game of poker, it is great. And it's cool for them to hear that from, you know, someone new to the game that, hey, you know, it's not like I need to get over these mental obstacles first. I can remove that, hopefully, like you said, from my yeah. thought process and just focus on, on gameplay. That's really awesome. Yeah, yeah. Like, just keep, think of each player. It's like innocent until proven guilty in terms of treating you differently than everybody else. Right. I like it. Yeah. Very good. Very good. <laughs> uh, well, many players over this past year and a half have had to transition to online poker. Uh, you know, from live poker, you were one of them. Fortunately, that led to your biggest ever score: eighty-five thousand dollars in an event on ACR. Why don't you tell us about uh, what that experience was like for you? <laughs> That was great. We, <laughs> at the beginning of the, um, of COVID, we, we started a stable for a little while and it just so happened that at that, at that point, I think we had maybe 15 to 18 players under us wow. and we were all on um, discord and they were all just railing, uh, virtually the, the, every hand, you know, they were all oh just God. like sending tons of emojis and all types of stuff. So it was actually really, really exciting uh, because compared to live, I mean, there's not a lot of interaction you can have with your rail because you, you'd be holding up the game. Right. <laughs> um, so, so online, they would just be like, set call or like, you know, <laughs> unlucky, you know, get back in there. It was just a lot of stuff you can read in real time. And right. I'd never experienced that. And so for that to be also my biggest score, I mean, I was just on cloud nine. I told Jesse, I was like, just, just, leave me alone, leave me alone. He would like, I was downstairs and he would kind of like hover the camera over like from upstairs and just to take a picture and try to like capture the moment. That's I was like, amazing. yeah, cause he makes me nervous if he's like around or seeing me and I'm just right. like, I just, I'm in the zone. Let me play. <laughs> I'm gonna that chat with so you a cool. lot. Well, <laughs> so what a really cool, fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, what a cool experience to have. It's fun, like you're talking about it in a similar way and you know, we had a Vanessa Cade on before on an on episode, or oh, I don't remember exactly, I'll look it up, but she was talking about the thousands of people who are watching on a Twitch stream. So you didn't yeah. have that, but you have like this core group of supporters who you know every single one of them. That, that's incredible. It was really fun. I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. And to what degree, let's be honest, we're a few steps away from it now. To what degree was the, the win a function of variance, you know, good luck in good spots? Or, you know, you're like, okay, like you said, you were in the zone and you knew at some point this was yours. Oh, 100%. I got lucky a bunch of times. Okay. I mean, yeah, you just have to. It was, I forget how many thousands of players. It was one of those crazy ACR 109s where there was just like, many day ones and then oh, okay. you, you know there was a day two in online tournaments you know that's huge um so yeah you have to run really hot okay. really really hot yeah <laughs> okay and I just I did look it up uh, Vanessa K was episode number 41 if anyone's looking for that one um so I said you know a lot of people had sort of had to transition to online poker uh had you played much online prior to the pandemic or was this sort of new to you not really. No, I, I played maybe some like WSOP tournaments. I had, I had satellited into a, a main event one summer or, oh, or did okay. I played a couple of their online bracelet stuff mm -hmm. when there was only like 
two in the summer. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So um, not really. I, I kind of was starting to pick it up um, that winter, I guess. How long ago is that now? 2019? I, yeah. was, I just made an ACR account that November. Oh, wow. And then okay. all the stuff kind of started kicking off in March. So, you know, that was what, good. What, what was that? transition like and how did and, and how do you find it compares the, the online poker to live poker well i really wanted to get online to to view each session as just kind of a snapshot shot of what i know currently mm. so i was trying to play each session just like almost like where am i at in poker wow. And I just thought it's so slow playing live to, to figure that out. And, and I don't have any, I have a terrible memory. So for all these people, all these poker players that know hands from years ago, I don't remember them from, you know, two hours ago. I have <laughs> no memory. Okay. I can't remember. Um, so I really needed a way that I could record my session, review it with Jesse later, and he could really pick apart my game. Mm -hmm. um, and I really should probably get back to that, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> I go, hey, sometimes I go verbalizing through... it, putting it out there, gives yeah. us a good idea, sure. Oh, yeah. So um, so what was it like? It was really just for me, like a study session. It just happened to be oh. I was really playing a tournament. Oh. Um, and then it's it's a matter of just trying to apply that live and just really trying to again strip away like yes you're playing with humans but just try to remember how many times you know how how, how many times have they opening through betting you all this stuff try not to take it personally just kind of view them as like see them in the digital space and then and then when the hand's over oh yeah we're human again and start wow. talking that's a, um, that's, a, that's a great um, interest. Again, an interesting perspective. Never heard it quite expressed that way before. That's really interesting. Yeah. You, you say you can't remember what happened two hours ago, but we're going to test that memory a little. Uh, okay. I can't <laughs> remember poker hands from two okay. hours ago. Well, I'm not going to ask you about a, a hand, but a particular tournament. It happened two years ago. Your first big live win, February 2019. You won a WSOP circuit ring a little under eighteen thousand dollars. What did it feel to get that first, you know, that that first feather in your cap? It was awesome. I <laughs> it was a turbo. It was a turbo circuit event. So mm -hmm. I was in and out of there in nine hours, and I had a ring, <laughs> and I was red. And Jesse was there. Jesse and a couple of our friends had kind of showed up, uh -huh. went to go eat real quick, like upstairs. You know how Rio you. If you play a circuit event at the Rio, you're not in the convention center. You're just kind yes. of okay. in the, the area, spots. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So to get food, a lot of people go to that burger place upstairs. Yeah. So it was a turbo event. When they left to grab a burger, uh, there were five of us left. When they came back, we were all photos. in for the win. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it was, wow. I mean, it was serious. Like there were, you know, we all had like five blinds. Um, oh, wow. When there were like five or six of us left, then it kind of consolidated and then um, me and this guy got heads up. I think it lasted like three hands and that was it. And it was over. And I was like, oh my gosh, because you just, you appreciate it more when you play a lot more tournaments because, um, you just bust a lot yeah. or you spend two or three days before you bust and then you got to right. shoot by into another day. One. <laughs> so doing it in a turbo was just really fun. Okay. Interesting. Oh, we've, well, we've referenced that. We've referenced your $85,000 win on ACR, uh, your win at the Lips event. Uh, you talked about Run It Up Reno. You won the Thursday Thriller over there. So I'm not, I, those are four of, of, of the big ones. Is yeah. it one of those or is it something else perhaps that is your most fit, you know, your, your favorite or your most treasured poker moment? Ooh, favorite or most treasured poker moment. Oh man, Robbie hit me with the difficult ones. I got to think for a second. Cause you've won so many. If you only won one, it's pretty easy, right? Maybe <laughs> it's not a win. Maybe it was like an aha moment or something. Like that. Hmm. Wow, this is difficult. We'll this give you a right. time chip. <laughs> okay, I'm positive. In. Um, actually, running up Reno, winning that one was especially fun. I had taken a really long break from poker and I was really in that space where, you know, sometimes, I mean, I don't know if this is everyone, but I have a very love-hate relationship with poker for a long time before I decided to go pro. And mm -hmm. I just realized, oh, the times I hate poker is when I'm, 
I'm, it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> so the times that I'm hating it is when I just really need to kind of dive a little deeper and study just a little bit harder and I'll get past that hump and love it again. Cause now I feel like, Oh, I learned something new. Um, those I was having that right before that. And then to show up and then have all these friends that you could party with after was really fun. We poured margaritas in that trophy and just, we're just <laughs> passing around this trophy. This is like totally pre COVID. obviously. <laughs> This is like not, how many years till people do this again, right? It kills bacteria though. The alcohol, you know, that takes care of itself. <laughs> it was fun. It was really fun. That's that cool. that actually is the most treasured moment because just like the after party and just knowing that a bunch of people were there to celebrate was cool. That's amazing to hear that. I I, I do want to dive deeper though. You you did mention something that you know I, I caught there that you had this sort of love hate relationship with poker before you decided to go pro. So what was it? that did make you make that decision that, okay, I'm not just gonna, you know, splash around. I really want to focus and, and make this my career. Well, I, I had learned back in 2012, that was when I first started learning how to play at all. And was just playing like low stakes cash games and just figuring it out. We were flying all over the place because Jesse was sponsored final table time. So really wasn't a lot of like me trying to get better. It was one of those things where my first summer experience is watching Jesse win second in the main event, wow. you know? So I was like, Oh, this is just what poker is. Right. You know? And, <laughs> We're and all oh, this is going to yeah, be so right. easy. Do you think, Oh, you're just going to win quickly. And, yeah. and I'm also, I was also surrounded by like some crushers. Like when I look back at that, like if I was a beginner, if I was trying to give advice to me back then, I'd be mm -hmm. like, go meet some other beginners because mm. I was really kind of hard on myself because I'm surrounded by all these guys that are crushing it. You know, it was like Russell Thomas, Mike Del Vecchio, Jesse, and, and then all of their friends. So it was kind of like the who's who of Vegas cash at that time. And, um, and comparing yourself to, to that when you're just not, you're not there, you haven't spent 10 years playing poker um, is craziness. So I, I played cash for a little while and I actually started working for run it once Phil Galfon's training site. And yeah. I worked there for two years, just administratively, uh, you know, managing content and stuff like that. Um, Great site for their training sure. videos. And, and I realized like, man, I, all these tournament videos are really fascinating. There's a lot more to it than I thought. Um, and actually there's even more dynamics. It, what it became my opinion, more dynamics than cash games. Mm -hmm. so that's why I said okay you know I quit working there and I I hired uh well I didn't really hire I whatever one of our friends is really good um you know Ankush Mondavia okay sure sure yeah I just said please I know you told me a million times you don't coach you don't coach can you just coach me just get me a little bit better at tournaments I actually want to try to get good uh, and he, he knows um, that you must that. mean it when when you when you phrase it that way yeah. Yeah. And he was like, fine, but I really suck at it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we did, we have a, a few sessions and that got me more comfortable admitting to mistakes with someone, mm -hmm. which I was not very good at still have a lot of trouble just being like, you know, open about, oh yeah, I just, I made a mistake. Um, and so, yeah, that was when that was really much. So that was around 2017. I said, okay, tournaments, let's just stick to that. Focus on this one thing. Mm -hmm. When it gets hard, just keep trying harder, dig in instead of just giving up and being like, all right, maybe I'll try cash again, you know? So instead of doing that, really just digging in. So that's kind of what I've been doing. And now that I'm hearing myself saying this out loud, I really got to get back in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually my next question. But before I ask the next question, um, I, I, I think, you know, folks, if, if you're listening, if you're watching and you're at that level where you are calling yourself a serious recreational player, and maybe you're having those thoughts of like, maybe I got to give this a try. Maybe not just, you know, the, the glory of leaving the nine to five for, for that sort of thing, but, you know, maybe you're also having your aha moment. It's very interesting to hear, you know, a, a now professional and, and that thought process and what it was that brought you to your decision. That's pretty cool. And also just like, you know, like I always wonder sometimes if, uh, you know, if dealers, you know, when they're dealing the hand, are they getting anything? Here you are doing administrative work and you're absorbing this, this poker information via osmosis, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, very, it's very interesting. They have some really good coaches on there. So I was, I was, 
yeah, I was taking it in for sure. Very awesome. curious. Sh shout out to Run It Once Training. Um, well, you know, like I said, my next question is, you know, like we mentioned all of these successes you had. Maybe one time it's a fluke, but you don't just usually stumble into final tables and wins. You know, you, you've got to study uh, what okay, you say you've got to get back in the lab. What does your study process look like? What sort of tools do you avail yourself of and, and, and what sort of learner are you as far as poker study? Oh, I just figured out what kind of learner I was reading a Brian Altman tweet randomly. Wow. And he maybe it's a tweet, but I, maybe it was an interview. But um, he said, I work in verse and and verse and bus or something like that. Okay. Oh, I wish I knew the phrase, but he basically just says, I, you know, I really like hunker down and, and work really hard, study, play, study, play. Um, and then he takes breaks. First and breaks. That's what it is. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. what it is. Yep. First and breaks. And I feel like that's what kind of learner I am. Um, I can burn out really quickly and start to get, um, I can start to get really down if I, if all of it's not clicking all at once, but that's just part of learning. Um, so I would say right now I'm still, <laughs> I'm still like uh, very conceptual, not very good at applying. <laughs> so okay. I really have to, you know, it's really just a matter of putting in the volume, you know, putting in time at the tables, whether it's online or live. It's been really tough with COVID because it's kind of like you feel safe and then you don't feel safe. So it's kind of like wishy-washy with, with live stuff and then online stuff. Um, there's really not much going on in Vegas right now online. So, okay. anyway, um, yeah, that's uh, my, my routine really looks like uh, pulling up. PO running through some sims, like just pick a spot, pick any spot. I know it sounds infinite and it can feel overwhelming, but just pick you the most interesting that hand that happened in your last session that maybe got you a little confused. And um, there's plenty of tutorials out there. Once you do that first sim, it all gets easier. <laughs> so okay. you just run the solver, you just kind of click around and see, hmm, like how does it want to play? And then more than that, you you ask yourself, why does it want to play that way? And then doesn't even apply to like humans playing and you, you just keep really diving in and you just figure out a lot just from wanting that running that one hand it's not so much how do I play this board it's just right. like how do I play in general right, right. how do I conceptualize a lot of things so that can that can get a little heady but you know even other things that are more simple is Jesse's optimal thing I you know all the pre-flop spots if you are a tournament player I can't stress enough how much pre-flop is important um, it just really is like you're shorter and shorter stack. Uh, people maybe aren't defending their big blind enough when they're getting insane odds, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just, a, it's everything post swap is built on where you enter the pot free mm -hmm. and, um, just kind of splashing around. You're making your life very difficult post swap. Right. Um, and if you know for sure, like I have this hand and I don't have this hand in every single spot post swap it becomes, poker becomes a lot easier. So that's sure. how I study. And I believe that is the tagline is, uh, please sign up for this floptimal thing, right? That's- uh, Yeah, that's, right? That's, this <laughs> floptimal thing. He's going to be so pumped that I said that. No, no. It's the floptimal app, folks. You can, yeah. find, you can find that. I mean, one. you can use whichever one you want. There's okay. all kinds of resources that tell yeah. you pre-flop stuff. And, yeah. and it's really a good place to start and kind of refresh. And also, if you've been studying that for a long time, it's kind of nice to like pat yourself and back and be like, yeah, I got that spot right. down. <laughs> so, so that's, that's just, I mean, that's a lot of self-study, a lot of self-discipline. Like you say, you know, me, me getting in the lab. Do you still sort of take certain situations and, and go back to Ankush? Do you go back to Jesse and discuss, do you have some sort of like a, a, a forum, you know, of, of close friends and, and study buddies yeah. that you do, you know, look at situations with? Yeah, um, we have Discord group that, you know, we'll just send hand histories and be like, what do you guys think of this spot? And we'll just kind of review it. Or um, we'll even watch most, you know, the most recent Poker Go final table and just kind of look at what, what are people doing? Like, why is Ali winning everything? <laughs> so, like, <laughs> you know, you just kind of go in and, and that makes it more, um, that makes it feel like more applicable, you know, like when you can see, Hey, if I just keep 
keep my head down and keep doing this stuff. I could end up like that one day. Right. Um, that ma- makes it a little more real. Like but yes, I do stuff. have a bunch of friends, luckily, who are way better at poker than me. And they will happily answer questions when I uh, finally do admit that I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yeah. cool. and shout, shout out to, I guess that's uh, Liam Servich, right? Who's winning everything. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. We talked a lot around Jesse. Let's talk about Jesse. Obviously, the two of you have some really cool stories together. You know, just as a human being, how did you guys meet? What's that story? <laughs> um, I actually met Jesse on a date with someone else. Um, we Wait, he was were... dating someone else, or you were dating? No, someone else? I was on the on a date with someone else, oh. and. Um, we had planned like a beach day, me and this guy. This is on Martha's Vineyard. I was interning as a dancer in this um, sort of, uh, it was kind of like a retreat space for dance companies. A lot of people from New York City kind of went there for the summer and we were just little interns. We got paid in like wine. Um, and so that was like a fun summer. Awesome. <laughs> so you can blame them for getting me really into wine. Um, so I I met this guy and he was just like, okay, let's go, let's have a beach day. And like I said, it was pretty hippie out there. Right. Um, he shows up and he had gotten a ride from this girl and then Jesse's in the front seat. So I was like, oh my God, there's these two other people. I kind of had, I kind of like panic. I'm like, I don't know them. I thought this was like a date one-on-one. So I run back inside and I get one of the other interns. It's like, come on with me. This is apparently a group thing. Right, right. So we all go to the beach together this guy that I was supposed to be on the date with proceeds to tell like the weirdest story of all time. Uh, Long story (laughs) short, he's talking about roasting like seagull hearts on the beach. And I was like, hmm, that's not for me. And she was totally into it. So I just started talking to Jesse. She starts talking to the other guy (laughs) and we just hit it off. And we, we just like spent like, I don't know, like 15 hours together for the rest of that day. Um, all four of us. And it was like, it proceeded to be a month of mayhem. Um, And so after that month, I told him like, look, because I I also majored in Spanish, but I never traveled um, to go try it out in the country. So I told him after this, I'm going to go to Spain and just backpack. Um, It'd be really cool if you join me because I know you you do this poker thing, right? It'd be cool if you join me. You don't have to be anywhere, do you? (laughs) He's like, sure. (laughs) And um, yeah, we just traveled, we backpacked for six weeks through Spain and we went to like the Netherlands and stuff like that. When we got home from that, I was like, well, what's next? He's like, well, I live in Vegas if you want to come move wow. in. And I was like, well, I don't see why not. And so I just, we drove to Vegas and we've been together ever since. So I love that was that 10 story. years ago. Uh, well, me gusta. Uh, as podemos uh, hacer esa, esto en oh, español. <laughs> I was wondering like, oh, you're going to go and answer in rapid fire, you know, no, 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 okay. no. I mean, if you, if you said it slowly, I would know what you were saying. Oh. I, like, I just like have a panic reaction of trying to speak to people because <laughs> to speak in Spanish back, because Jesse would just, he would go up to somebody and just ask the question that he knew how to ask because he had traveled before when I okay. had so okay. he just would ask them a sp- question in Spanish and then move aside and just wait for me to like figure it out <laughs> I love it that's a case what, what so I that, asked you is I said oh so we could have done this interview in Spanish that's what I right. said yeah, <laughs> definitely cool. not. Uh, well when we talked to Jesse on episode number 47 um he said uh, this is not the newlywed game, don't worry. So he said that you, beca- <laughs> you have become the more intense poke competitor in the relationship. Is that true? That's hilarious. Um, I mean, everybody in general is just more intense than him. Come on, he's just super chill. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> good reply. Okay, that's so, I mean, yeah, I'm, a, I'm probably more intense than Jesse. Like, that's just not saying much. <laughs> okay. okay, that's fair. Uh, you mentioned, you've mentioned your love for travel. Um, you know, obviously times are a little bit different right now, but just in, in oh, regular yes. times and, and hopefully things will get back to normal, um, you know, sooner than later. How do you guys balance your poker activity versus your non-poker activity when you're going somewhere new or, or exotic? I love that question. A lot of people were asking me that in the card chat form, actually, when I first uh, signed on. Mm-hmm. And 
some people are like, how do you plan a trip? And honestly, I, we just, we just look at the tournament dates, the, the full length of the series. And usually those places add a little bit of, they, they add a few tournaments at the beginning and the end that are kind of like fluff. So we kind of just say, okay, maybe we'll play those, maybe not. Okay. Um, so we give our, we pick a series. We pick a location that either we have been and loved or that we haven't been yet and really want to try out. Um, and then we just build the trip around that. Nice. Um, I really recommend just like, if you can travel with a couple other people and get an Airbnb that's close to the place, it gets you sort of walking around the city. You're not just in the hotel where the poker is happening. Right. Um, and then you just stumble upon things sort of as you're walking around. Um, yeah. Trip advisor. They're all great. Um, but yeah, that's how we start the trip. And then we just kind of build it out from there. I like it. Do you guys have plans, uh, you know, for any specific locations once, uh, you know, borders start opening up and then things become regular again? We don't have any plans right now. It's too depressing. Oh, okay. <laughs> we don't have any, but you know, Australia is always number one on the list. And we've actually been talking about going back to South Africa, but I don't know if they have a, a lot of poker going on right now. They used to have a WPT every once yeah, in a while. Sure. Um, but we're always, I mean, we're, we're also open to just traveling for traveling sake. And if poker happens to be there, great. Nice. Um, but we live in Vegas. So it's right. like, <laughs> that's, that's true such a different perspective someone who lived up in like to, to so many of us Vegas is that vacation destination that you know that poker mecca but when you literally have it at your doorstep you know right. you can go you can go other places just for the enjoyment and not searching yeah. for the poker I guess yeah um, we're super lucky right so I, I mentioned at the top of the show you are of course one of our most recent additions to the team of Cards Chat Ambassadors along with Dara O'Kearney and Matt Vaughn um, what does it mean to you to, to, to sport the patch, to, to be a Cards Chat ambassador? And what are, you know, some things or, or if there's one specific thing that you want to accomplish in this role? Oh, I just want to encourage people to check off some items on their poker bucket list. I really want them to go out and do things that they've always wanted to do and they just kind of put it off. But you know, whether it's through videos, because I'll be making videos and stuff like that, either of our travel or just of strategy, stuff like that for the forums. But um, I really just want to encourage people to just get out and play and have a good time. Um, it seems like that's already the vibe of the community, but um, if they can see it at like even higher stakes, people are having fun, even, you know, even smaller buy-in budgets can go to different series and make it worth it for them. Um, anything like, I just want to, I just want to motivate people to like, just go out and do it because I mean, I know I keep mentioning the vloggers, but they really inspired me to do that because I, I play at these tables where everybody's mentioning, Oh yeah. I just played poker for the first time because I watched you. Uh -huh. That's wow. Really cool. And, cool and why not? Like poker is really fun. We all enjoy it for a reason. And, um, these trips are really cool. It's like a traveling summer camp of poker right. players <laughs> everywhere you go. Awesome. Um, yeah. So just experiencing that and not being afraid that, oh, I, I won't fit in because I don't know anybody or whatever. You know, that's just not the mentality. Everybody's welcome. So, right. Right. Yeah. Great answer. I like it. I like it. And uh, certainly worthy of sporting the patch, as we say. Uh, one of the first things that you did jump into your, your, your first duty, you had that AMA thread that we've referenced a couple of yes, times on yes. the Cards Chat forums. Um, I want to ask you maybe sort of expand uh, a little bit on a couple of the questions you answered there. Um, you know, you've mentioned it there. And also, again, just now, you know, about the travel, you said your favorite, you know, on, you know, favorite place to go. Your number one on the list is always uh you know, Australia, uh, Crown Casino, Melbourne. Why? I mean, besides just being far away, you know, like you could just say Mars, <laughs> you know, like, what, what, what's so captivating about Australia, about Melbourne, Crown Casino? Oh, man, I think as far as poker goes, the, the social interaction you have at the table in Australia, it just seems people are, are showing up to have fun. It's like a running up Reno every day. You know, people wow. are just showing up to have fun. Um, and I don't want to oversell it. It's not like every table is amazing, but it really does feel like uh, people are a little chattier there. They're not afraid to, to be a little bit more, you know, vocal. Whereas I guess the culture in America and maybe in Europe is very, you just, you're quiet and okay. you're stone faced in the middle of the hand. 
that is kind of all out the window when you go to Australia. It's kind of like they they poke fun at you. It, that's just like I feel like I'm with my people when I'm there. You know, nice. they're just they're just there, um, not taking themselves too seriously. Okay, I like it. Now, now I want to go. No, I, I, I've always wanted to go, but now even more so. Like like wait a minute, you know, Ashley promised me a fun table. What's going on? Right, right. <laughs> I know. I know. It's pretty good. Like even the dealers will get in and like make fun of people. I love it. Like not in a mean way, <laughs> but awesome. they're willing to just get out. And I love it. It's like, yes, even the dealers should have a great time. Yes, you're at work, but whatever. Have oh, a great fine. time. I like it. Uh, and the second question, you had a very interesting answer on that AMA about GTO. Uh, you know, game theory, optimal play and how applicable it is at the low and mid stakes games. Um, just to probe a little further, what elements of GTO do you feel are most applicable and helpful at those lower stakes? Hmm. That is a good question, which means it's hard. Um, <laughs> we ask the tough ones here, you know? <laughs> yes. yes. I guess it's just all a matter of what everyone else is doing at the games that you play um, very specifically. So if the environment that you're in is like people opening to 5X in a cash game and um, you know that's just like the standard, it doesn't really matter if like what you've studied all revolves around like people opening to two and a half big blinds. Mm. Um, you, have to, you have to adapt and I think going back to kind of what we we're talking about with PO, it's not so much a memorizing game. It's really figuring out why the computer is doing what it's doing so mm-hmm. that you can adjust on the fly as well. It's so hard. This is all really hard, heady stuff I'm talking about. This is not just something we all know. Right. Like people like to walk around like, oh yeah, I'm GTO. Yeah. Like, no, you're not. Because everybody at the table is different. You don't know how everyone, it's always going to be a human game. Yeah. But I mean, at the lower levels, I think it's just knowing how to adjust your ranges on the fly to somebody who's opening every hand to somebody who's super tight and but still opening small, like those types of things. Um, it's, it's just really helpful to visualize while you're playing a hand, your exactly what you have. Um, some people don't even know if they have the nuts in any spot. Wow. You know what I mean by that? Like, yeah, like if you're yeah. playing in a hand and you get to the river and you're just like bluffing and you can't tell your, you can't explain to yourself why, because you're, you're just like, you're just making a bet. You don't right. really know why. Right. Um, those are the types of things that I think just studying a little bit helps you crystallize. It just like kind of helps you explain things to yourself in a better way. Well, I don't know if I'm explaining this well. well I, I can tell you I, what, what you're saying makes perfect sense because I'm someone, you know, I've never studied any poker charts, you know, full disclosure. Yeah. I've never done any of that yeah. stuff. I've never hardcore gotten in the lab. I can speak the lingo, you know, but yeah. I, I've never actually dived deep in that sense, but I have played tons of hours in you know, one, two, one, three, two, five cash games in, you know, low stakes tournaments. And what you're saying certainly makes sense, you know, because even at those stakes, we do make those sorts of adjustments. And, you know, every table is different. Like you said, you know, we look at what is everyone doing? Why are they doing those sorts of things? And, you know, if that falls into the GTO, you know, bucket, as it were, you know, that, that that makes perfect sense. So I would say that you explained it pretty well. Uh, Just, I, I would say that. Um, my last question for you before we get into the community questions, what are your goals going forward, Ashley? You know, you, you got the patch, you got the sponsorship deal. Are we going to start seeing you playing in the, the 25K soon? Or do you have like a, a full slate of WSOP events? What can we expect from you in the near and sort of mid to longer term uh, future for you? Yeah, I think agreeing to this ambassadorship was kind of me like stepping a little bit out of like the shadow of my fiance and being like, hey, I don't want to hide behind you forever. And I love him so much. And we and I tell and I don't say that to make him sound like he was, you know, in the way it's just it's so it's he's great. And he's won a bunch of money. and He's so good at poker. Sometimes that can feel like, okay, I'll just be over here. For sure. And it's kind of just uh some an opportunity that came along was like yeah I want to try it really hard too <laughs> and nice. So, nice. yeah I'll be playing a lot of tournaments um I'll be in a lot more uh live streams I was playing on live at the bike um trying to get into some cash games that like I said are more social more fun just 
for the nature of being on a live stream. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to like branch out and not kind of just be like a quiet, like just sitting there type of thing. It's way more fun. I've just realized, I mean, quarantine is really just like kind of just really exposed that to me. Like it's way more fun to not like be quiet and sit still. It's way more fun to show up and try to like bring some fun and not hold back really. And I think maybe I was holding back for a long time. And when, um, actually Ryan LaPlante was the one who put me in touch with Debbie of Cards Chat and was just like, hey, you might like this. So shout out to Ryan because he's always, uh, he's always great for that. <laughs> he's a good dude. And we'll shout out specifically episode number 33, where he was our guest. And of course, to Debbie, we all love Debbie, you know, been with Cards Chat for yeah. like, you know, since, Car since Cards Chat started, I think 15 years. So um, yeah, great stuff. Uh, great answers. I love it. I already feel like I know tons more about you. It's pretty cool. But the community has questions for you too. And in this segment of the show, we turn to you guys, our Cards Chat community, to see what questions you wanted to ask our guests. We do have a dedicated thread for this on the Cards Chat forum. So as we announce who our future guests are going to be, please be sure to send in your questions. We've got a few of our regulars who sent in a bunch of questions for you. Uh, they're not exactly rapid fire. There's a lot of questions here and then, you know, everyone wants to know more about you because you just sort of stepped out, uh, you know, like, oh, okay, actually, well, she wants the attention. Let's give her some, let's learn more oh, about no. <laughs> it. Um, Crystals has a few questions for you. Thank you, Crystals. Um, how different, Ashley, is the game when you're playing on a table where your whole cards are being displayed, apropos the live streams, versus one where only you know what you have? Mm. You are you are juggling a lot more things in your head, that's for sure, because um, you're you're trying to focus on what like what hands does my opponent have, but you're also like, oh God, like everything leading up to this that I play correctly, you're, you're starting to throw those distractions in your head. So it's very different. I would say it's very different. And that's why I'm kind of like forcing myself to do them because I think you can mm. only get better over time. Right. I mean, some people at this point, it's like, look at Phil Hellmuth and Negroni. They probably mostly play on stream. So it's like, they're used to it. It means nothing to them. Right. Um, but yeah, it's very different. And I think uh, the biggest one is you think other people are, adjusting a lot more than they really are because they're on camera so yeah. then you can you can tend to level yourself a little bit cool and you did mention the king of name dropping so phil helmuth was episode <laughs> number four uh, here on the cards chat podcast as well i play this game with everybody it's good to, to for me to remember mm -hmm. exercise my own muscle memory and or i may have a chart you know, alphabetized here if it was whatever. So maybe, I don't know, allegedly. Um, you know, so you said it just sort of happened, the opportunity to present it, presented itself. Uh, Crystals wants to know, what was the big draw for you to become a member of the Cards Chat family? I mean, anyone could have come to you, you know, with this so, sort of sponsorship offer. You see Cards Chat's name, how do you react when, when that opportunity is presented? Um, I reacted, uh, basically I met Debbie and she was, she was basically explaining to me that, um, card chat is supposed to be very friendly, very fun. It's, it's promoting that social, uh, part of poker. So that just fits naturally for me. That's what I want to do. Um, I don't play on any online sites that I would like, you know, would want to represent or something like that. It's not, that's, I, I want to be, uh, sort of representing the fun of poker, it's just people having a good time. <laughs> it's pretty simple. <laughs> I like it. Very cool. Well, it's a little bit more of a by contrast type of question. Last one from Crystals here. What has been the most awkward moment that you've had at the poker table? Ooh, the most awkward moment I've had at the poker table. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I should say. I had a weird moment one time when I was still learning how to play cash. I'm just gonna say, okay. <laughs> and um, this guy, I felt so bad for him. He was uh, very, very, very old. And he had his like World War II veteran hat on. And he was having a lot of trouble like hearing the dealer. Mm. And there was one pot that he was not even in. And the dealer picked up all the chips, like kind of stacked them like this. The pot was like this much, maybe like a hundred bucks, right? This, okay. this, this is a hundred dollars worth of fives right here, okay? Right. And he shipped it to the guy on accident who was not in the hand. This this uh, veteran guy. Oh, wow. And then when he said, oh, oh, no, that's his pot. I'm so sorry. Uh, he just, it was like, I mean, he had been sitting quietly all day minding his own business and just a, a 
like it was like a light switch flipped and he just like he just like threw the chips on the table oh picked up the dealer button chucked it across the table and it hit me like right in the forehead so and I just like looked at him and I was like oh I was like, oh my God. And, and then they just, it had been two people come, two uh, security guys come over. They just escort the guy out. Oh, I mean, he probably played there like every day. I mean, this is like the win. Oh. The old win. Oh, he probably played there every single day and just something happened. And, and he just threw that. And it was like, he's like this veteran. He's like this old guy. You right. want to feel like you feel for him. But then he also just chucked the dealer button right. in my face. So like, <laughs> I think that's pretty much definition of awkward. It's yeah. like, I just don't know how to feel right now. So wow. Wow. Heck of a story. Great question. Great answer. Thank you, Crystals. And thank you, Ashley, for that one. Uh, Shells, another one of our regulars, uh, has a few questions for you as well. Um, Ashley, what does an average poker week look like for you? Ooh, it, there hasn't been a lot of average ones um, <laughs> past year and a half. Yeah. Um, a mix of probably let me just say what it'll look like going forward it's a mix of tournaments and cash right okay. now that's what i'm into um i i think they playing a little bit of both is keeping each one feeling fresh for me keeping like i want to study more for the for the next session um so anytime we can play these little tv sessions it's really fun to do those and playing tournaments it's just it feels like my bread and butter at this point studying them the most so an average week is probably Thursday to Sunday, um, all tournaments, unless I bust, then I'll run over and play cash games Monday to Wednesday. I like to be active and I don't know, do away from the table work and, you know, yeah, I would say four, four days a week is really, um, my sweet spot. For cool. Okay. Uh, next question from shells besides winning a tournament, what is the most exciting thing about being a poker player? Hmm. The, all the places around the world you get to see in the most unique ways. Mm. Um, an example is we were at World Series Europe one time and we did a trip and it was in this little village outside of Paris that year. But they party, I think it was Poker Stars maybe, hosted a... A poker player party in the Eiffel Tower. Wow. So it was like, it wow. was like, yeah, like Jeff Gross, Daniel Negroni, like all the big, you know, they were like all represented by poker stars. Right. And so they were just, they hired these, like, they look like Vegas showgirls, but it was just like, you took the little diagonal elevator up one of the legs. Yeah. And then yeah, you just had, definitely... like the center of this Eiffel Tower. Wow. Partying. And it's just poker play. You're just like, what is my life? You're just looking around like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, you know, so those types of moments for me, that's, that's pretty freaking exciting. And I think that's kind of why we all follow the tournament tour. You never know what type of things are going to happen. <laughs> Love it. Fantastic answer. Great story as well. Um, Shells has two more questions for you. What do you like to do most away from the poker room? Don't say study. <laughs> um, poker related or just like, Oh, no, not like necessarily. Do? Okay. Um, Oh man, so many things, but uh, I don't know. Well, way away from the poker table, there I do so much not poker related, but um, I love, like I said before, yoga and dance and uh, meeting up for friends at random places, have drinks. Uh, we play a lot of werewolves out here. I don't know uh -huh, if you've heard that yeah, game, but yeah, we'll host sure. werewolves or we'll have barbecues. Um, yeah, anything. Cool anything like that. Okay. Like <laughs> and final question from Shells. I think I might know the answer here, but I'm not sure. Um, based on what you said, what would you be doing if you weren't a poker player? Hmm. You think I would be a dancer, don't well, you? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, probably, I would probably, I would probably <laughs> probably be a broke ass dancer. That's what I'd probably be. <laughs> so you'd be a break dancer. Got it. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, Acid Burn FX, always with the most creative questions. The last uh, forum contributor here. Uh, thank you very much for submitting these. Uh, a little bit more um, generic, a little bit more out there. So we hope you're ready for them, Ashley. Number one Would the world be a better place if all leaders were women? 
Wow. Yeah, right? Okay. Right turn. Woo. <laughs> um, hmm. I think probably less. I don't war. think there's a right or wrong answer before you. Before probably you put less. It probably less war and probably less things that are affected by like that impulse to really kind of like peacock around a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so I guess yeah, if you're against that, but you know who knows? I think there are great men in the world, but um, more women leaders, yes. All women leaders, no, because then I think you still run into the same problems that you have when you have mostly male leaders. It's just a, it's better to have a diverse group in everything, pretty much, because you know we all come from different experiences, and so that will um, help shape better decision making. I think the more um, perspectives you have. That I have to say, if there is a GTO answer to that question, I think that's what it was. That's like such a range balance. I love that. It's a range balanced <laughs> answer there. That's really cool. Um, who, uh, Acid Burn FX wants to know, who is the most interesting person you've ever met? Oh my goodness. Ever met? I mean, it's probably that guy that I was trying to go on a date with and then <laughs> ended up with Jesse. I mean, who, this guy was nuts. Like I'm telling you, we still hung out for another month, but he was the most interesting person. You never knew if he was telling you like a true story or not, but they were always like out their stories. He would randomly break into song with a guitar or like be sketching things. And we would always be kind of like cruising around. We'd go downtown and then this guy just like pulls it. He just has like a thing of like whiskey and a paper bag in his back pocket. And he's like, and he's kind of has like a Spanish accent. And so we were like, eh. and he was like, I am with whiskey. You know, this guy's crazy, but he was awesome. Anyway, his name is Justin. He's great. And, but he also, he looks like an Abercrombie model. So let's oh, just wow. do that. <laughs> like all of these things were so bizarre. Wow. Um, He's definitely the most interesting. I don't know if it's in a good or bad way. Just okay. Well, <laughs> sh shout out to Justin and the road not taken. Um, two more questions oh. here from Acid Burn FX. If only you, I love, I love such creative questions. If only you could read people's minds to your advantage, would you read them, or do you think that that's unethical? Wow, oh, I would really like to have dinner with this person. <laughs> Like, You're not the about, first to say something like that. Thank you, Acid like, Burn FX. Great. Yeah, Acid Burn. Like, I think you're the you're the antidote to all the iPhone whipping out at dinner tables when conversations get awkward. Like, you just have a question, and that's awesome. Um, okay, can you repeat it? Because I forgot it already. Sure. <laughs> if you could only, if you, if only you could read people's minds to your advantage, would you read them, or do you think that that's unethical? Hmm. Last question's a lot easier. No, I, no, I, I certainly wouldn't want to read them. <laughs> I don't know if it's unethical, but I just, I just think um, the the filter that you give yourself before mm -hmm. things leave your brain is says a lot about who you are. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to judge a person by what just like randomly pops into their head. Nice, great answer. Cool. Okay. Last question for you. Um, what is your, from Acid Burn FX, what is your most treasured possession? My most treasured possession? Mm -hmm. uh, this house that we just moved into by far. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I wish you guys a, a, a long and healthy time there and with making lots of memories. That, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, I've certainly had some great memories here over the last hour plus. Thank you very much for to everyone who has sent in questions for Ashley Sleep. Uh, again, just a friendly reminder to everyone out there in the Card Shack community. We'd love to see you submit your questions for our future podcast guest in the dedicated thread on the forums please be sure to give us a good review on iTunes and spread the word via your social media channels if you like the show. Ashley, before we let you go, anything else you'd like to tell our audience? 
Oh, Rowie, I just want to say thank you to you. I <laughs> had first actually heard about Cards Chat because of your podcast. No and, kidding. Really? You know, oh, that's cool. You know, thank you. I know I'm a kind of unconventional <laughs> guest, and it just so happens because I'm an ambassador that you brought me here. But I want to say a shout out to you and thank you because you have really cool guests on here and you ask great questions and you come prepared. And, you know, it's really cool to just have people in the poker industry that do their job really well. So, Congrats to you. That's what I want to say. Wow. That's uh, okay. Well, if there's any way to end off a podcast, it's like that one. I appreciate that very, very yeah. much more than, you know, thank you very much. That's very, very kind of you to say. Um, thank you again, Ashley. Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Cards Chat. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. I wish you all a wonderful day. <laughs>